fierce fighting in Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, has already seen the destruction of homes, schools, even a church. The UN says at least 227 civilians have been killed nationwide. In the weeks since the fighting began, the real death toll could be higher than that, though. Ukraine's state emergency service had put a much higher number out, 2,000, but later backtracked on that. CNN, of course, cannot independently confirm these figures. Now, all of this as refugees continue streaming out of Ukraine to neighbouring countries like Poland, Hungary, Romania. The UN says a million people have now fled since the invasion began. Despite the Russian onslaught, Ukrainians pushing back any way they can. Ukrainians like this man who waves a flag in front of Russian tanks occupying the main square in Kherson. Or well, hundreds of people northeast of there who blocked an access road to a nuclear power plant as Russian forces advanced in the area. Garbage trucks also being used to stop Russian forces, with the local mayor saying, quote, nobody is going to surrender the city. Now, even teenagers are doing their part. This girl was learning how to treat battle injuries in school even before the war broke out. While some white-collar professionals like these ones have been practicing their shooting skills at a range. Meanwhile, residents here in Lviv in western Ukraine are also getting ready for battle, even though they're not on the front lines. Anderson Cooper with that report. In an old factory in Lviv, they prepare for war as best they can. Welding steel to block roads, hedgehogs they're called. These are most effective, I'm told, when the ground is soft and that they can uh, get dug down into the earth or perhaps even on a cobblestone street, they could uh, dig down between the cobblestones. Uh, but with a uh, hedgehog uh, this size, it's unlikely to be able to stop uh, a Russian tank, um, but perhaps a, a vehicle or a Humvee. Lviv has so far been mostly unscathed. At night, air raid sirens sound, but the fight is still further east. Each night, each day, the determination here grows. At a brewery in Lviv, they now make Molotov cocktails. Taras Maselko says they've made 2,000 at least using empty bottles of a popular anti-Putin beer. It's Putin Huilo, which means Putin Dickhead, and you would see... Wait, the beer is called Putin Dickhead? Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been making Putin uh, Dickhead it's beer? It's actually, we started to brew this beer in 2015 because in 2014 the Russians came to Crimea and Peninsula and got it and uh, in eastern uh, regions, so uh, this label has a history already, so. Wow. Yeah, but you see normally... That's quite the, that's quite the image. Uh, it's a yeah. primitive weapon, but potentially deadly. These Molotov cocktails also have additional materials in them to ensure the fire will stick to whatever it's thrown at. Petrol alone isn't good enough. You, you want something to make it sticky so that it sticks yeah. on, yeah, on a person. Yeah, on a surface. When we got here uh, to the factory, there was a group of maybe 70 or so men who were all uh, standing around a car, uh, and there was somebody in a, in a uniform, Ukrainian in a uniform, who was explaining to them how to throw uh, a Molotov cocktail inside a vehicle to the best effect. Um, there's a lot of people here who are trying to get as much training as they can uh, in order to be able to face uh, Russian forces if and when they come. In another neighborhood, residents gather supplies and send them wherever they're needed. Spike strips to puncture tires, flak jackets with metal plates inside. We're continually sending them to our guys there throughout the day, he says. Here you can see camouflage nets there to use as a cover so that the enemy doesn't know where our tanks and armored personnel carriers are located. In other rooms, we have medicine and groceries. A week ago, he was a construction worker, but then Putin invaded and everything changed. You have a message to Vladimir Putin. What is it? What would I tell him, he says? I would tell him he can go f himself. 14-year-old Andri's school is closed. He says volunteering makes him less nervous about the war. Are you scared? Uh, on first time, on first day I was, but now uh, I understand that we need help and support our soldiers and people, and, uh, and then uh, we will live in peace, in, in peace. Before leaving, we meet Pavlo and his son, Artur. 
just 10 months old, wrapped in the Ukrainian flag. He told me, I just want to say my son Artur will learn to say glory to Ukraine faster than he says mom or dad. Those will be his first words, Slava Ukraine. Yes, yes. <laughs> Anderson Cooper, CNN, Lviv, Ukraine. Now, this isn't the first time Ukrainians have been put to the test. Their push for freedom and independence on full display more than eight years ago during deadly protest in Kyiv's Maidan or Independence Square. The demonstrations involved a botched trade deal and Ukraine's pro-Russian president and quickly escalated into an all-out battle. It led to a chain of events over the years leading to where we are now. Winter on Fire, Ukraine's Fight for Freedom is a documentary that captured the journey of Ukraine's violent revolution. Have a look. European Union leaders and Ukraine have failed to sign an historic free trade deal after a last minute U-turn from Kiev. And I'm delighted to say joining me now is the director of Winter on Fire, Evgeny Afanyevsky. And uh, thanks so much for being with us. I mean, the world has been watching, you know, really in awe at the resilience of the Ukrainian people taking up arms, you know, fighting Russia's massive military head on. What does this kind of courage say about the soul of this country? You know, Gora, first of all, thank you for having me. I think Maidan and all the protests that I witnessed and I captured in Winter on Fire proved that these people have one direction, direction to freedom, to fight for democracy, direction that they initiated in 1991 when the Ukraine became independent, and the direction that they were following. And for them to go backwards towards uh, former Soviet Union, towards the direction of slavery, losing freedom of speech, freedom of uh, expression, I think it's not a life situation. For them, they rather go and yeah. die under the bullets, under the bombs, but not die as slaves. And I think that's the direction that I saw on Maidan Square in 2013, 14. And that's what we're witnessing today this determination to free their own country, free their own land. Uh, the, the Maidan uprising was a, was a major setback for Putin, obviously, and, and one he never really forgot. Now, you've said that Putin cares about land over people, even his own uh, people, and you think Putin's own soldiers aren't 100% behind him. How so? You know what? I can't talk on behalf of his soldiers because I never interviewed his soldiers. But I will tell you something. What I hear from these soldiers and what I see from these soldiers, they're not always behind this. They're living in fear. They're living in fear because I witnessed how their own uh, calls to their own moms, begging moms to ask the authorities to exchange uh, people who've been captured. But at the same time, they immediately fearing for the lives of their parents, lives of their families, how the local authorities can react to that. So at the end of the day, it's a very unpredicted situation where two countries that were at some point brothers became enemies because of the certain direction that government's putting them. And I think not every soldier is even understanding why they're there. Because the narrative, the yeah. media narrative in Russia is completely di different than the narrative is outside of Russia. Yeah, that, a lot of people here say that their relatives in Russia they've spoken to don't even really know what is going on uh, in this country just across the border. Um, you know, I, 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 I feel for your documentary because I was in the Maidan in 2014 uh, when those Ukrainians died getting rid of that pro-Moscow president. I then went to Crimea and I was there uh, when the Russians arrived. The little green men saw them coming into our hotel. Uh, now, what the Maidan showed, of course, was Ukrainians did not want want a pro-Moscow president and government. Now, if, if there is another pro-Moscow government installed here, what will Ukrainians do? 
First of all, I don't believe in that. I don't believe because Ukrainians will never allow this to happen. Like I already said it, they rather die under the bullets or bombs, but they will not give up their land. And I emphasize this. I think this was miscalculation of Putin, but it was also something important that coming out of Maidan. They united. Today, the world is united around them. It's a great lesson to the world because at the end of the day, everything what's happened there, either in 2013-14 or either what's happening today, it can happen anywhere in the world. I do appreciate that the world is paying attention to this great lesson that we're learning more and more and more and standing by Ukraine because it can happen to any country. And we're not allowed things like this happen. We need to be united. The world needs to be united. Because the Ukrainians being united on Maidan, you witness this. Young and old, rich and poor, different social classes, every religion denomination was there. So at the end of the day, they've been united, they won. If the world will unite together with Ukraine, we will win this battle against dictatorships and we will not allow things like this happen in any other place. So I think that's the Im yeah. immediate lesson that we need to learn. And, and, and before I, I let you go, win, winter on fire, to... Ukraine's fight for... Right, yes. Uh, the, the documentary um, is on Netflix in the US and elsewhere. It is notably not on Netflix in Russia, um, unsurprisingly, really. It, it is Oscar-nominated now. What, what, what do you hope the film achieves, especially now in the context of this invasion? You know what? I think we're learning a lot of lessons. Through the period of time between Maidan and the invasion, we saw how this movie inspired Hong Kong, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and many other places in the world. Today, we're seeing how this movie inspiring back people across the globe to go and support unity, support the bravery of the Ukrainian nation. We're learning what it means to be together and achieve things together. I think it also explains a lot to the world today in the context of Ukraine and in the context of the bravery of these people and why they're standing for their land and for the future of their kids. So I think that's what this movie is achieving. And it's a great lesson. It's a great lesson for everybody. What means to fight for democracy? What values you can lose like this over seconds and what values they're trying to achieve in this fight? Because for Ukrainians, it is important not to go backwards. I think today entire world witnessed how in Russia, kids who were protested against the war been arrested. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression is mm. taken in this country. So why Ukrainians who've been free and following the direction of the European Union, they have freedom of speech and freedom of expression, will go backwards to the place where people are slaves and where people not have the dignity of a human person. So I think that's why for Ukrainians to stand for their land till the last drop of their blood is really important. And that's what they will do. And that's what I witnessed in Ukraine. And that's what's happening today. It, it, it's a remarkable film in many ways. It is a roadmap to where we are now and couldn't be more uh, timely. Um, Yevgeny Afinyevsky, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, much more from Ukraine coming up. But first, uh, let's head back to Atlanta and Rosemary Church. Rosemary, hi. Thanks so much, Michael. We'll talk to you soon. Stock trading remains closed in Moscow, but global oil prices continue to surge. More on the economic impact of the Russian invasion in a live report just ahead.